You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the guns, the drugs, from my generation, I'll take the fall. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome back to the 10th of August 1998. Tonight Raw takes place in Omaha, Nebraska while Nitro's in Robin City, South Dakota. Please excuse my voice today, I'm dealing with a bad throat and I didn't want to stop the series for a week. It's one of the caveats of doing a weekly series is making sure it gets done no matter what so I appreciate you sticking this one out. I'm hoping the Road Wild 98 video is still up and I hope you guys checked it out too. The show itself wasn't great but if we're reliving the war we gotta take the rough with the smooth. As always though it's all about context and you'll get more out of this week's episode if you checked out the pay per view so give it a watch if you haven't done so already. Tony Schiavone announces at the start of Nitro that footage of the Road Wild main event will not be shown on TNT. Sounds like NW Hollywood want to pretend like the main event never happened and to be honest so do I. Apparently. A WCW official will come down to talk about the match though, so I don't know, whatever. The commentators also give us some good news. Tonight in the Nitro main event, Goldberg's winning streak comes to an end because the man called Ming gets a title shot. Is Goldberg man enough to spear the Minger? Let's wait and see. Nitro kicked off with the Barbarian vs Hacksaw Jim Duggan, I'm starting to notice a pattern now. Barbarian brought the pain with a mean old chin lock but Duggan was still able to win with a schoolboy pin. As is tradition, Hugh Morse ran down to attack Hacksaw, so Ming ran down to attack everyone. Serious, Morris, Barbarian and Jimmy Hart all got taken out and then the greatest moment in WCW history happened when Ming took out the evil Doug Dillinger and a bunch of security guys. Ming stands among a pile of lifeless bodies as he looks ahead to his title match tonight against Goldberg. It's gonna be amazing guys, trust me. Lex Luger comes out next for a promo, one of the greatest speakers of our generation. Luger says it was Scott Hall and Bret Hart who took him out last week and seeing as Luger got a piece of Scott on Thunder, he now wants a piece of the hitman. Luger says he's not leaving the building until he gets a match with Bret, so his excellency makes his way down to the ring and he calls Lex a liar. The total package is making up a story to make himself sound tough when in reality he got beat up by a food vendor. Hart says Lex has to earn his shot, he can't just demand one. Luger's just jealous that Lex's best friend Sting is like a brother to the hitman and Lex says there's nothing Brad has that the total package wants except maybe that US title. I don't know Lex, Brett's wrestling ability and jam would be highly desirable I'd imagine. Luger then says this. You put the bell up tonight for a title or I can knock your teeth down your throat right now. Lex wants Brett to put the belt up for a title. Uh, Brett thinks about it for a moment and he grants Luger a shot at the US title tonight on Nitro. Get ready for some Saturday Night -like Fever with Ross Winderkind and some disco dancing with the Disco Inferno. He's Tokyo Magnum messed up big time at Road Wild and Alex Wright says that Tokyo fumbled the ball. I'm sure he did Alex, I'm sure he did. Alex gets a little, a little harsh when he says Tokyo should commit Harakiri, I mean that's a step too far does Wunderkind, lighten up. And Disco tells Magnum that if he wants to keep idolizing the Inferno and Alex then he needs to perform at the same level. So if Magnum can't beat Eddie Guerrero tonight on Nitro then he's on his own, forever. Magnum tried his best, he hit Eddie with a sweet jumping back kick followed by a face buster, but all it took was a tilt award backbreaker and a brain buster to put Magnum down for the frog splash. So it appears that the dream team of Alex, Disco and Tokyo is no more. What a shame. 
Perry Sutter and Cole Kenyon out for a match and I'm now beginning to realise that WCW had no idea what to do with this storyline either. Perry and Chris had a good back and forth match as expected with Sutter impressing with a wide range of suplexes and Kenyon pulling off some of his best moves including the electric chair face buster. Towards the end of the bout the competitors utilised the top rope when Kenyon pulled off a neck breaker and Sutter delivered an overhead belly to belly throw. But the match ended with Lodi distracting the referee while Raven hit Sutter with an even flow. Kenyon puts an arm over Perry and Kenyon wins the match. This rivalry really hasn't went anywhere at all since it began and the most frustrating thing about this is that all three guys involved are so so talented. Backstage Ming's beating the hell out of more security guys, no one can stop the Minger and if I were Goldberg I'd be soiling in my pants right about now. Our number one wraps up with a Steve McMichael vs Sick Boy matchup. I was waiting patiently for some magical McMichael bumps but he didn't do too bad here. This clothesline spot could have been a bit more refined but uh, what can you do? Steve wins with a tombstone pile driver and he's still jonesing for the return of the horseman. Nitro continues on with old Chinese proverbs from Hulk Hogan, on Raw Mankind cuts a promo. Raw opens up with Mankind going a little crazy backstage, he's upset with what happened last week of course and he's also upset that he was attacked on Sunday Night Heat. The thing is, he was attacked by The Undertaker who once again wore Kane's attire, so Mankind knows there's something up between the Phenom and the Big Red Machine. Mick says all he wants is the truth, he wants to know what's going on and there's only one person who has ever told Foley the truth during his time in WWF and that's Vince McMahon. So Mankind calls Vince out to the ring and Vince says this must be pretty humiliating for Mankind. Here's Foley sitting on the floor asking Vince McMahon to help him when Vince McMahon man detest people who need help. McMahon says that Foley doesn't want Vince to help him, he wants Vince to hurt him because the truth hurts. Kane and The Undertaker took turns at hitting Mankind with a steel chair last week and then on Sunday Night Heat, it might as well have been Kane who attacked him when The Undertaker wore that disguise. Kane and The Undertaker are in collusion, that's the cold hard truth, they are one of the same. Paul Bear and Kane then show up and Studley Paul says McMahon may be the master manipulator of WWF but he won't poison the minds of Mankind and Kane. Vince's conspiracy theories are beginning to break the harmony within this tag team but Vinnie Mac isn't through just yet. Vince tells Paul that the man standing next to him isn't his son, it's a son of a bitch. Vince can smell the stench of death and that has to be The Undertaker wearing Kane's gear. McMahon demands that the mask comes off and when he tries to remove it himself the lights go out in the arena and The Undertaker appears. Kane is nowhere to be found. The Phenom takes out Mankind and Paul before chasing McMahon back up the rampway and the commentators are confused about this turn of events. Was it The Undertaker standing next to Paul that whole time? If not then why did Kane take himself off? On Nitro, Hogan says he's now destroyed all of his enemies including Jay Leno. He's doing that thing where he just pretends he didn't take a loss on pay per view and he's completely lying to the fans. Hollywood says the NWOites want the world title back and the championship needs to go back around the waist of Hollywood Hulk Hogan, so Goldberg gets put on notice, the clock is now ticking. Hollywood tells WCW that he wants his title shot and he wants Billy Boy brought to him on a silver platter. In the meantime though, Goldberg has to face Ming and so Eric Bischoff announces that the NWO are going to provide security for that matchup. Ming's on an absolute rampage right now and the NWO wouldn't want anything happening to the world champ, so the black and white are going to help Goldberg by making sure Ming doesn't step out of line. Very good. Old Chinese proverb says, a t-shirt is worth a thousand words. Hey pal. You might have heard recently that Endeavor bought the WWE and my company is being merged with the UFC. You may have also heard that I grew a stupid mustache, took over creative again on WWE Raw, and I'm doing my best to completely fuck everything up. I'll have you know, mister, that it's actually my son Shane who's been making all these silly decisions. I, Vincent Kennedy McMahon, have never booked a bad show in my life. Buy the shirt, support wrestling bios, and I wish you the best in your future endeavors. Oh, and one more thing. Stone Cold Steve Austin can lick the back of my fat hairy plums. Check it out, The Undertaker walks into a room backstage and Kane's standing right there. The WWF might as well wrap this storyline up now because we don't need any more proof. 
We've got Jackie vs. Luna Vachon next on Raw. On Nitro, Stevie Ray takes on Chavo Guerrero. Sable introduces the competitors in the Raw match. Luna comes out with the oddities and check this out too. Big Kurgans join the faction. That sucks. Jackie gets her head slammed on the mat and when Mark Merrow tries to interfere he's pulled down from the apron by Sable. Kurgan's gonna ensure that Mark doesn't lay a finger on his wife. Jackie spears the referee and the two fall out of the ring but this ref bump leads to nothing. Back in the ring Jackie fights back when she throws Luna around by the hair and then Luna gets kneed right in her oddity. Lovely. That dirty cheater Sable shakes the ropes when Jackie goes upstairs and this leads to Luna winning the match after performing a splash and landing on Jackie's hair. Sable presents Luna with Jackie's bikini contest trophy because why not and Raw moves on to its next match. On Nitro, Chavo was scheduled to take on Stevie Ray but he can't find Pepe anywhere. Chris Jericho's got Chavo's stallion and he tells Chavo to come get him. So Guerrero gets lured backstage, we hear the sound of a backstage beatdown and Chris re-emerges with Pepe's head removed from his body. Chris gets in the ring and he challenges Stevie to a match. Chavo's a little busy right now and seeing as Jericho's a man from the streets just like Stevie Ray and seeing as Jericho's one bad mama jamma, Chris will be happy to take Stevie on tonight and take away that television title. Stevie Ray says let's get it on and the match begins with Chris getting shoved out of the ring. When the match resumes Chris goes low with a drop kick and he manages to bring Stevie down with a crucifix pin but he only gets a two count and a big boot to the face. A front suplex on the ropes from Stevie doesn't look too good and Jericho looks a little annoyed as he backdrops Stevie out of the ring. Chris then pulls off a diving forearm from the ring to the outside but back in the ring Stevie catches Jericho with a power slam. Stevie performs a back body drop, Chris performs a drop kick, Jericho then gets vicious in the corner and he ends up hitting Mark Curtis with a low blow. The match ends when Stevie hits Chris with a clothesline but then, strangely, the Giant shows up and he chokeslams Stevie Ray. Why the Giant's attacking Stevie or why the Giant's helping Jericho is a complete mystery but Jericho applies the Lion Tamer and Chris wins the TV title one night after losing the Cruiserweight title. It's a good move in my opinion, Chris is a good champion who, in WCW at least, makes championships better through storylines that he comes up with. But this also means that Stevie Ray just lost a championship that technically wasn't his to lose. Eric Bischoff cuts a promo next on Nitro. On Raw, Darren Drozdow faces Savio Vega in a Brawl for All contest. Droz gets hit hard in the face at the opening bell and Savio then goes for a takedown but he was unsuccessful. Droz then gets in a hard right hand and the referee tries to say that Savio slipped, even the king can't believe Jack Dome's call here. Savio gets a few body shots in before the end of the round and that's a hard one to score. I'd give it to Droz for the mean right hand he hit Savio with and I'm not gonna sit here and count every punch landed so 5 points to Darren. Savio's determined as he comes out for round 2 but he's not accurate at all with his punches leaving himself open a few times and draws counters with ease. Darren also performs a takedown in round 2, there's a genuine slip from Savio at the end of the round also, and this one's way easier to score, it's 10 points for draws. In the final round, Savio tried a takedown but he had no control, Darren's takedown attempt was much better seconds later. Draws also knocked Savio a bit loopy during the final moments of the match, so it's another easy win here for Darren Drozdov with another 10 points. The audience got really into this one and they cheered at the end of the fight. Our second brawl for all fight a little later on doesn't get the same crowd reaction at all. On Nitro, Eric Bischoff comes out with Miss Elizabeth and he says he's the best of the best when it comes to making difficult executive decisions in World Championship Wrestling. To give an example of the tough decisions Eric makes, he says he's gonna show everyone what happened in the Road Wide main event and break the order that was made not to show any stills or any footage. Eric only shows images of himself and Hogan beating up Leno and DDP. He retells the story of the match and he says he pinned DDP at the end of the bout. And he tells fans not to watch the Tonight show because Jay's a liar and he'll likely show doctored footage from Road Wild. A complete waste of time here, it would have been ok if the NWO didn't do this kind of thing before but I remember Hogan doing the same thing after matches with Roddy Piper. It's tired, it's boring and it shows a lack of creativity within WCW and the NWO storyline. The Raw main event gets announced, a 4 corners tag team title match. This one eats up a lot of Raw's runtime tonight so this match will go up against 2 matches on Monday Nitro. 
Members of D-Generation X arrived to Raw, and there's rumors going around about the group splitting up. Remember the X-Pac vs Triple H match last week and China's interference? Michael Cole wants a word with China in regards to this rumored breakup, and China gives Cole two words instead before shoving him into Hunter Z3. On Raw next, LOD 2000 take on Southern Justice. On Nitro, we've got Psychosis vs Lismark Jr vs Rey Mysterio Jr. Hawk falls off the ramp when the LOD's pyro goes off. He's wasted once again, and WWF decides to cut over for a commercial break. We come back to see Hawk being a little confrontational with officials as they try to figure out what's going on with the Road Warrior. We cut over again to a Sunday Night Heat replay. Tennessee Broccoli tried to get Southern Justice to attack Double J, but the plan backfired and the boys turned on their manager. Say goodbye to Sweet T Lee because our boys riding off into the sunset and leaving Reliving the War forever. Back in the arena, Southern Justice come out and they get in a fight with Hawk on the rampway. Once Hawk's brought to the back, the giant robot monster attacks Animal. So here comes Darren Drozdov to help Animal out. Unfortunately for Draws, Double J shows up holding a guitar. It has a message written on it, don't piss me off. Alright then. Draws gets the guitar smashed over his head and Double J, for whatever reason, decides to give Darren a haircut with some clippers he brought to Raw's war. Jim Ross says this is a new Double J, he's got a big change in attitude, so let's see how yet another incarnation of Double J plays out on WWF TV. On Nitro, the triple threat cruiserweight match started off with Psychosis dominating both his opponents. Ray takes a set down front suplex while Lismark Jr takes a clothesline. Psychosis then damages both his opponents when he drop kicks Ray and he lands on Lismark, but his good luck runs out when Lismark performs a tilt award backbreaker. Ray then impresses with a somersault senton to the outside and Lismark lends a hand when Ray performs a springboard seated senton back in the ring, but the friendship between Ray and Lismark short lived when they begin breaking each other's covers. A field double team move leads to Ray and Lismark fighting each other and Ray gets the upper hand with a spinning wheel kick followed by a split leg and moonsault. Psychosis tries to get some of Ray next but Mysterio pulls off a unique arm breaker slam and then we get to see one of the best finishes I've ever seen in a Nitro Cruiserweight match. Ray gets monkey flipped and he delivers a pinning Hurricane Rana on Lismark Jr. Absolutely picture perfect and a good win for Ray Mysterio. We've got a DX promo next on Raw, while on Nitro, Bret Hart defends the US title against Lex Luger. Triple H says everyone wants to know what's happening with D-Generation X. X-Pac snatches the mic away from Hunter and he says he's just about had it with Triple H and his bitch. Waltman's words, not mine. X-Pac's thought long and hard about this and he's come to the conclusion that Hunter and China are a pair of jackoffs. Hunter thinks the same about X-Pac and he also thinks the same about Road Dog and Billy Gunn. The outlaws confirm what Hunter's saying here and yes, every member of D-Generation X is a jackoff and it seems like everyone's also in agreement about the fact too. So with that in mind, should DX stay together or should they split? Hunter wants to give the fans what they want, the DX split, so the lads form a line and they get ready to show their asses on TV, but China says no. The people are tired of seeing DX's hairy holes and if anyone's gonna initiate a DX split, it's gonna be the ninth wonder of the world. So DX are not breaking up, the group remains as crude as ever, but Triple H better know his role because he's got a big IC title match coming up in 3 weeks time at Summerslam. This Nitro bout's gonna be interesting because you just know Brett won't let Lex get away with the same match he's been having for the past year or so. Now Lex isn't as proficient in the ring as Bret Hart, let's be honest. So you can bet your last dollar that Lex is gonna sell for the majority of this one and he'll let Brett work everything out in terms of direction. Brett wants to lock up but Lex wants to show that he's down with the kids, his excellency has no time for such tomfoolery. Luger then shoves Brett and he does his little crab pose so Luger's used up a third of his repertoire, he's now in big big trouble. We get a test of strength and the total package brings Brett to his knees, but then the hitman pulls off a wrist lock and Lex gets his pythons punched. Luger gets a little confused when he gets put on a hammer lock, he escapes with a back elbow and oh dear, there's the Lex Luger clothesline, he's only got a power slam, atomic drops, the bionic forearm and the torture rack left. Brett knows there's no point in continuing on so he grabs his belt and he goes to leave the arena. Flexi Lexi intercepts the US champion though and the match gets back in the ring. And there's another crab pose, we're double dipping now folks. Oh check it out, arm drags from Lex Luger, I bet that was scary. Brett stays 
is locked in an arm bar forever, but when he finally brings Lex to the corner, the excellence of execution chokes Lex with his boot. We're on the outside of the ring after a commercial break and Brett remains in control. Luger gets slammed on the floor and the hitman pulls off the Hollywood Hogan air cup. The best, ladies and gents, the absolute best. Inside the ring, Lex gets punched and choked in the corner, but Lex fires back as the crowd pop. The hitman silences the audience by kicking Lex right in his total package, and after complaining to the referee about closed fists, the hitman delivers a backbreaker. Lex gets headbutted, Hart pulls off his elbow drop, a side rushing leg sweep messes Lex up, and Brett then performs a leg drop. This right here is how I imagine the match playing out. Hart strikes Lex's midsection before delivering a DDT. We see more strikes and chokes in the corner from Brett. Lex then gets suplexed in the middle of the ring and Brett gets frustrated with Lex constantly kicking out. Hart then brings Luger to the corner and he strikes his lower back. A hard Irish whip to the corner sends Lex to the mat and Luger looks absolutely exhausted. The break comes when Brett jumps off the middle rope and Lex gets a boot up. Brett takes an atomic drop and an inverted atomic drop because, you know, Lex likes to keep things exciting. Lex then hits two clotheslines followed by the bionic forearm and when Lex locks in a sleeper, Brett rams the total package into Charles Robinson. Hart then pulls out those brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks but we'll call them brass knucks anyway. But Lex sees it coming and he applies the torture rack. The ref wakes up, Brett submits and Lex Luger becomes the new US champion. I, I, I'll say this, seeing the total package as US champion again is cool and the belt is synonymous with Lex, but there's not many Bret Harts who can carry matches for him in 1998. Let's see where it goes and let's see if Lex can bring prestige to the United States Championship. Though the way things have been going for Lex over this past year, I'm not expecting much. I'm going to enjoy kicking the living crap out of Lex Luger tonight. Oh, that's the opening that oh! Hart was waiting for. DDT. 10 no, at least he didn't know it's going. He's out. He's out. He's out for the sharpshooter. Godfather vs Vader on Raw, Juventud Guerrero vs Billy Kidman on Nitro. After Godfather makes his way to the ring with his high maintenance escorts, we see Bart Gunn having a few words with JR. Bart's annoyed that Ross has been making excuses for Steve Williams and he reminds JR that he knocked Dr. Death out cold in the brawl for all. To be honest, I didn't hear JR making any excuses for Williams, but whatever, let's just roll with it. Jim says he didn't say anything, Bart Gunn's a hell of a fighter, but he has to prove how tough he is when he faces the Godfather next week on Raw. Bart takes a seat to watch this upcoming match, but the match doesn't happen because Vader gets an offer he can't refuse, a night with the Godfather's Creatures of the Night. He initially says no, but when Godfather says all three women are on offer, Vader agrees. Godfather says they'll even wash your clothes for you, and I think this was a personal jab at Vader, who, according to JR on his podcast, didn't wash his gear very often, and guys would complain about Vader's overall hygiene, including Shawn Michaels. That's all true, by the way, and you can hear Jim talk about it on clips uploaded to YouTube. Vader approaches Bart Gunn and he advises Bart to take the same offer next week before his Brawl for All match. So Bart knocks Vader out and the new Brawl for All favourite then attacks the Godfather. I have no idea why they were mixing in kayfabe elements with the Brawl for All tournament but here we are. Godfather leaves with his women so the only ride Vader got was the ride to the hospital. Unlucky Vader, unlucky. On Nitro, we get another Hoovy vs Kidman match, but it's not as good as their last Monday Night Battle, unfortunately. It only gets three and a half minutes. Check out Clean Cut Billy Kidman, though, our boy's finally off the smack. Well done, William. The new cruiserweight champ snaps the challenger's neck across the top rope, and Hoovy follows up with a springboard dropkick. Guerrera misses a baseball slide, and Kidman's dropkick sends the champ into the guardrail. We then see Kidman's leg drop from the apron, and Luke, getting off the smack, has made Kidman a better wrestler as he applies the deadliest of submission holds, the chin lock. Hoovy misses a stinger splash, and he ends up taking a power slam. He lands on his feet following a German suplex attempt, but his roll up only scores a two. So, he delivers a springboard Hurricane Rana while Kidman was sitting on the ropes, and Guerrera ends it with a 450. A decent TV match, but watch their previous Nitro encounter for something a lot better. After the match, the commentators show what really happened in the Road Wild main event, making Bischoff's promo earlier completely pointless. And sorry guys, my throat is nearly gone, it is so sore. Let's continue on with Reliving the War and then I'll go and see a doctor.
Val Venus cuts a promo next on Raw. On Nitro, Raven takes on flock member Horace Boulder. So, 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 this is John Wayne Bobbitt, and for those who don't know, my god, Mr. Bobbitt here also got his wee winky cut off. His wife cut it off with a carving knife. His wife then drove away and she threw his manhood onto a roadside field. Cops found the severed sausage after a search was organized and it was reattached after a nine and a half hour operation. He then became an adult movie star, starring in a movie named John Wayne Bobbitt Uncut. And that's the brief history of John Wayne Bobbitt. This definitely has Vince Russo's sticky fingerprints all over it. Waller wants to know if Venus is hanging in there and Venus says he's half the man he used to be. For some reason Kyogo finds this all very funny. Val lived by the sword, he died by the sword, but then he says the big Val Boski is alive and well as he strips down to his purple wrestling trunks. Venus explains what happened. The cutting block was cold, Venus got shrinkage, and Mr. Bobbitt for some reason was backstage at Raw last week and he turned the lights off just before Mr. Yamaguchi choppy choppied Val's PP. Jerry Lawler wants to know what John and Val got up to last night, but he then cuts John short by wanting confirmation that his wife threw his knob out of a car window. John says, yeah, it definitely happened. And Lawler wonders what that would look like on the side of a milk carton if it wasn't found. Venus wraps it up by telling Mrs. Yamaguchi that it's been a long, hard road, but it ends right here. No woman's worth the trouble that Kyogo put Val through. So Mrs. Yamaguchi gets told to hit the bricks and Val throws a battery at her. Jim Ross wonders what she's gonna do with it and he catches on seconds later. So in short, the whole choppy choppy thing was put together because WWF were able to secure John Wayne Bobbitt for an appearance on Raw. You can't really argue with results though because, as mentioned before, this is one of those storylines that everyone remembers from the Attitude Era. Oh, I forgot to mention too, Dustin Runnels issued a warning before the segment in regards to adult entertainment being shown on WWF and he advised parents to keep an eye on what their children watch on Monday nights. His message was brought from the Evangelists Against Television, Movies and Entertainment, or Eat Me for short. On Nitro, Raven brings his band of dicks down to the ring and he's angry that the flock let him down. Riggs, Sick Boy and Kidman didn't help Raven at Road Wild and so they need to be punished. Riggs takes an even flow, he calls Lodi worthless, and Horace cost Raven the match when he used the stop sign so Horace is going to get his ass kicked on Nitro. Horace stops Raven from slapping him in the face, so Raven punches Horace in the face instead and the match gets underway. Raven bites Horace's forehead, he throws his back into Horace after an Irish whip, it goes to the outside where Horace takes a Russian leg sweep into the guardrail, but Mr. Boulder manages to hit Raven with his stop sign when the two get back in the ring. Raven gets launched into the stop sign after Horace sets it up in the corner. Horace then body slams his opponent before going to the top rope, but he misses his target and Raven tells Lodi to hand him a steel chair. Raven performs the drop toe hold and Horace takes it well. The flock then get distracted by Kenyon showing up on the rampway, and the distraction allows Saturn to hit the ring and Raven takes a death volley driver. Tony Schiavone thinks that Kenyon and Saturn are working together here, but no one knows. There's a high probability that Kenyon and Saturn will just start fighting each other again next week, so I don't know. Brawl for all time, Big Bully Bradshaw vs Mark Merrow, on Nitro it's Kurt Hennig vs Conan, again. Mark Merrow stepping in here for Steve Blackman, Jim Ross says it's a knee injury but Steve's actually back at the Mervug Dojo trying to learn Dan Sever and how to fight, reports state it's going well. Here's the Brawl for All tournament bracket, so whoever wins this one faces draws in the semi-finals. Bradshaw knows that Mero can box, so the big Texan tries a takedown after getting lit up with a left hook. The same thing happens again, only on the second attempt Bradshaw actually scores 5 points. And Bradshaw's game plan's pretty obvious after round 1, he's gonna run in like a big old bull and hope he can take Mark down. 5 points each in round 1, Mero landed more punches. At the beginning of round 2, Mero tries a quick 2 hit combo and it seems to piss Bradshaw off. The big man throws punches while holding Mark down and Bradshaw refuses to let go. I would have deducted 5 points right here but I would have given him another 5 points after a solid takedown. Mero tries another left but he misses, Bradshaw grapples Mero with the ropes just before the end of round 2, so again I'd score that 5 to Mero for the most punches. After Bradshaw's point deduction, I have Mero winning this one before round 3 begins. 
The final round begins with Bradshaw again holding Mark at the ropes before throwing him on the mat. Jack Doan awards 5 points, but I really wouldn't have, seeing as it came from an illegal hold at the ring ropes. Mark Merrow curses at the referee too after he says it's 5 points to Bradshaw, and even JBL knows that he's fighting dirty here. Mark then counters a Bradshaw takedown, and once again he refuses to let go when the referee steps in. The crowd boos while Bradshaw looks at the referee like he's stupid, but Bradshaw knows exactly what he's doing. Mark lands a few body shots, and when Bradshaw tries to grapple again, the marvelous one lays in more punches. Bradshaw then just falls on top of Mero, and the round ends. I definitely give that fight to Mark Mero, but the judges say it's a draw, so another round gets announced to a mixed reaction. In round 4, Mero goes for body shots while Bradshaw tries headshots. Bradshaw shouts at the referee after getting warned about holding on to his opponent, and then Bradshaw scores a takedown. Mero again lands more punches, but the referees decide that Bradshaw is the winner, and I don't agree at all. There never should have been a round 4 with Bradshaw bending the rules and also getting takedown points when he really shouldn't have. On Nitro, we get a Conan vs Kurt Hennig rematch, and quick side note, if you didn't see Conan inducting Rey Mysterio into the 2023 Hall of Fame, then go check it out ASAP. K-Dog was absolutely brilliant. There's a slight misstep in the ring when the match gets underway, but Conan makes up for it with his rolling clothesline. All Kurt could think about was getting his weekly time out on the outside. Kurt walks around as the crowd chants for the wolf pack, a kick to the midsection and a clubbing blow to the back puts Conan down, Hennig uses his legs to snap Conan's neck and it didn't look too hot this time around. Hennig stops Conan's comeback with an eye poke followed by a back suplex, Conan replies with an X factor, and the match ends when Kurt puts Conan down again with a clothesline before grabbing Conan's chain. Hennig drops the jewellery when Billy Silverman steps in and Conan decides to use the chain against Kurt. Kurt gets choked out and the referee disqualifies K-Dog. Hennig walks away saying no one from the red and black can defeat Kurt Hennig. Alright, so we've got a long four corners tag team match on Raw going up against two Nitro matches. Hall and Giant vs Nash and Sting, and Goldberg defending the world belt against the Minger. So the teams on Raw are The Rock and Owen, Kane and Mankind, Austin and Taker, and the New Age Outlaws. Like Ladies and gentlemen, seats. boys and girls, children of all ages. Oh man. Who who are you? Shut up. Oh. Ken Shamrock attacks Owen Hart before all teams have entered the ring while DX runs down to attack the rock. Shamrock puts Owen in an ankle lock and Steve Blackman runs down to tell Kenny Boy he did well tonight. Ken's like, are you sure, Sensei Blackman? And Blackman's like, yes, young Kenneth, you may release him now. After a commercial break, we see that Delos come down to replace Owen Hart, a big main event opportunity for the European champion. And then the final two teams enter the arena for this big tag team main event. This is not an elimination match, it's one fall to a finish. There's obviously a lot going on in this one, so I'll try to summarize the best I can without going Going into too much detail. Austin and Mankind start the match off. Austin breaks free from a mandible claw and Mankind dodges a stone cold stunner. We think Foley's leaving the match but he comes back only to take a suplex. And then Mick tags in Delo and Mick stands beside the rock in the nation's corner. You know, they should have did this for all four corner tag team matches, make guys stand beside their opponents after tagging out. A fan tries to get in the ring but Art Hebner and security deal with the issue promptly so the match can continue on. Austin hits Delo with a Luthez press before tagging in Kane, Kane does very little before tagging in Billy Gunn, and Mr. Ass hits Delo with a Famouser followed by a Gorilla Press Slam. Austin and Undertaker watch on as Mick Foley and Road Dog do a little work, we get Billy Gunn and Delo again and we see a jackhammer from Mr. Ass, Undertaker breaks up Billy's cover and Billy thinks twice about attacking the dead man. Billy Gunn tags in Austin while Undertaker was the legal man and the champ squares up to the number one contender. JR says these two can fight each other if they want but they can't pin each other. Austin and Taker decide to go after the outlaws instead and Road Dog gets hit with old school before tagging in Delo. We then get quick tags from The Rock and Delo and the European champ even applies a chin lock. A chin lock in a four corner tag team match. Unreal. 
Dilo delivers the lowdown, but Billy Gunn runs in to make the save, so The Rock hits the people's elbow. The audience absolutely loved it, but Austin broke up the cover. Undertaker ends up getting tagged in, and all hell breaks loose. In the middle of the chaos, Kane tags in, and he chokeslams his big brother in the middle of the ring. Kane then covers The Undertaker, and Undertaker's shoulders get counted to the mat. The audience is a little shocked, Stone Cold looks perplexed, and Jerry Lawler isn't buying it either. Undertaker sets up immediately after taking the move, a move he's taken before and a move that he's kicked out of before, and Stone Cold just knows that his tag team partner handed the tag belts away to Kane and Mankind. Undertaker just looks at Steve, and Steve leaves the ring looking both very angry and disappointed at his tag team partner. Alright, two Nitro matches. The tag titles are on the line first as Nash and Sting try to recapture the gold from Scott Hall and the Giant. Scott conducts his survey, it's one more for the good guys. Scott throws his toothpick at Nash and he laughs his ass off, but then he gets clocked a few times and he ends up in the wrong corner. Scott avoids a jackknife and he gets out of the ring to regroup. He gets back in to slap Big Kev around a bit, but Nash comes back with a clothesline and the Giant decides to tag in. Big Sexy lays in a few knee strikes, followed by a corner clothesline. Things don't work out too well for the Giant, so Scott comes back in, but Nash remains in control. That is, until Hall delivers a low blow. There's limited time here, so Nash doesn't get a chance to build up a meaningful hot tag. He floors the Giant with a big boot, and to be fair, the crowd still goes nuts when the Stinger gets tagged in. Giant gets knocked out of the ring, Hall takes a face buster, the Icon then pulls off three Stinger splashes before Scott hits the canvas, and then Sting applies the Scorpion Deathlock. To save his partner and to save the tag team belts, the Giant chokeslams the referee, so it's a DQ finish. The Wolfpack are pissed off with the outcome, but it was pretty smart of the Giant to get DQ'd, at least it wasn't another NWO run in. After a commercial break, the Giant, Hall and Hollywood Hogan come back down to the ring for the world title match. Sting, Nash and Lex Luger also come down to provide security, so basically we have a lumberjack match. The competitors make their way down to the ring, the bell sounds off and, oh yeah, the Minger starts off strong and Billy Boy's in a lot of trouble. Goldberg comes back with a forearm shot and a standing sidekick. Ming's so amped up that he doesn't know which side of the ring to get out of. Scott Hall thinks Ming should just apply the Tongan death grip and get it over with, but Ming ends up taking another kick followed by the rolling leg lock. Ming does manage to kick Goldberg and the champ falls to the outside, and this leads to Hollywood Hogan attacking Bill and the Wolfpack running over to even the odds. Back in the ring, Ming applies the Tongan death grip, but for some reason he lets it go. The commentators say that Ming thought he just won the match, but seeing as he never lets go of the death grip until way after the final bell, then you can see why this statement doesn't make any sense. Goldberg gets up and he spears Ming before hitting the jackhammer, and Goldberg retains the world title in a lackluster main event. Hogan hits Goldberg with a chair from behind and Nash runs in to chase Hogan off. Goldberg thinks it was Kevin who hit him, so Big Sexy takes a spear before Nitro goes off the air. Starcade 98 is now in sight guys, you've been warned. Alright, so remember at Road Wild when Tony Schiavone suggested Goldberg should get extra wins on the street counter because he was in a battle royal? Well, WCW did count every Goldberg elimination as a victory. I know, I, I know, it's absolutely ridiculous. WCW say that the streak is now 131-0, but it's actually 127-0. I'm giving this week's point to Nitro. Neither show was great this week, but the matches on Nitro were better. Red vs Lex, Jericho vs Stevie Ray, and the Cruiserweight Triple Threat matches being highlights. Raw had a much better main event, but as a complete show, I thought WCW's offering was slightly better. Raw still got 69 points, Nitro's got 61, and we've got 16 ties on the board. In the TV ratings, Nitro defeated Raw with a 4.6 against a 4.5. It's a narrow victory, but a victory nonetheless. Next week on Raw, Gangrel makes his Monday night debut. We get treated to a Nation vs DX street fight, and Bart Gunn takes on the Godfather in the Brawl for All. On Nitro, Eddie Guerrero gets personal with Eric Bischoff, Goldberg defends the world title in the main event, and a ghost from Hulk Hogan's past makes his debut in WCW. Strap yourselves in folks, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. Thanks for watching guys, and again I appreciate you sticking this one out. I'll see you all next week, and take care.